I feel absolutely insane sharing this, but a man stands at the foot of my bed every night, and he has been doing this ever since I could remember. Even though he's always given me super bad vibes, I used to try to be optimistic and chalk it up to being a good spirit or a guardian angel, but I know what being around good spirits is like. And after this past year, I know that's definitely not what he or it is. This, this sounds really, really weird, but it's almost like he's kind of protective of me. He usually gets more active if I talk about or start thinking about what's happening or if I bring my boyfriend over. I can tell immediately when he's pissed and it almost gets so bad to the point where my fight or flight response kicks in and I have to leave my house to get my anxiety to chill out. It started to get worse about six months ago and I made the awesome decision of trying to cleanse my house with some sage to try and calm him down a bit. Nothing too extreme, right? Huh, <sighs> you thought. It was a really nice spring day, sunny, beautiful, no wind. The weather you would imagine a really nice music video to be shot in. I invited my extremely skeptical boyfriend over for company and help. We started opening up all the doors and windows in the house in preparation. Nothing weird, it was honestly really pleasant. It was even fine when I cleansed the first room in my house. But when I went to the second room is when things started getting weird. There was a loud noise in the other room, which turned out to be an empty coat rack. That was about a foot and a half away on the floor from its original position. We were both kind of spooked, but chalked it up to the wind and kept going. There was only one room left to cleanse, and the vibe of my house immediately did a 180. As I walked to the third room of my house, my dogs, who had been hanging out in the living room, very swiftly left my house with their ears back and their tails down. My boyfriend and I walked into the third room, and I wanted to throw up. Something felt so wrong. I could tell that my skeptic boyfriend was unsettled also, so I made light-hearted conversation. That made it better for about 20 seconds, but then he and I both witnessed the door to the room we were in being slammed shut. It wasn't a vacuum from anywhere else in the house due to all the doors and the windows being open. There was no wind that day. There was no gradual build-up in velocity of the shutting of the door like a vacuum effect in houses that can do that to doors. The only way I can describe it is being violently slammed shut, as if someone was really, really pissed. I thought my boyfriend was going to shit his pants, and he made us leave the house immediately. Needless to say, he wasn't skeptic after that day. More things happened after that, but that's another can of worms for a different day. No... This isn't a joke. It's not a creepypasta. I don't have any psychological problems and I'm not religious. I'm just a regular person who just so happened to stumble upon this place and decided to finally share a tiny portion of this whole thing out. Which, this is just a tiny portion. There's so, so much more. But I know if I think or talk about this, more strange things are going to start happening again. I just wanted to finally get this off my chest and maybe get some advice or answers for people that have gone through stuff like this. Because honestly, I don't know what to do. Number 7 I have quite a few stories of creepy or bizarre encounters usually taking place on public transport or involving catcallers, perverts that wouldn't leave me alone. This one involves neither of those and is one of the more creepy things that I've dealt with. This happened just over two years ago, during my first year at Sixth Form College. I was 16 at the time, I'm now 19. I usually got the bus home since I was studying art and psychology, among other things, which usually meant I would be carrying some pretty heavy sketchbook as well as a couple of heavy binders full of notes, and I have back and chest problems, which meant I couldn't carry heavy stuff for too long. On days when I didn't have to bring as much stuff home, I would usually walk. It was about a half an hour walk between my college and my house, and I usually walked home with a friend. On this particular day, however, she had got a ride home from another friend, so I was walking by myself. It was also winter, so it was already dark by the time I set off home. To get to my house, I would usually walk through a park. I could either go through the actual park area, but that usually added around 20 minutes to my journey, since it was a pretty big park. 
there was also a pretty densely wooded area between the park and a housing estate with a dirt path running through it, which is the route I usually took home since it shaved about 10 minutes off my journey. Lots of people walked their dogs along the route, so I didn't really feel worried about walking that way. I usually just listened to music and walked on autopilot until I got to the main road. Because of how dark it was and how dense the trees were, it was really dark while I was walking down the path. It took me a while to realize it since I was walking fast and not paying much attention, but I noticed that there was a light flickering up ahead, partially hidden by the trees. As I got closer, I realized that the light was coming from a fire. In the middle of the woodland area, there was a bonfire and a man standing by it, side onto the dirt path and staring into the fire. He was pretty far away and I couldn't see him very well, but I could see that there was something in his hand. It was white, probably a letter or a photograph or something, and he was throwing something else into the fire. There were two black trash bags on the ground near him. If it wasn't for the light of the fire, I wouldn't have seen them. I thought it was kind of suspicious, but we weren't too far from a residential area, so I assumed that he was burning some old letters or bills, bank statements, whatever, stuff with personal information on them that you couldn't just throw away. In all honesty, it was weird, but I didn't think too much of it and just kept walking. It would only take me a few minutes to get to the road near the residential area, and then it was a five minute walk or so to my house. I was near the tree line when I glanced over my shoulder and saw the man standing in the middle of the dirt path about 25 feet behind me. He hadn't put the fire out since I could still see the light from it through the trees started walking towards me, slowly at first, before starting to run, shouting something at me, but I couldn't tell what he was saying. Luckily, I hadn't stopped walking while looking back, and I was already close to the main residential road, so I sped up and crossed. I rounded a corner and hid behind a fence, and glanced up to see him looking around, before going back into the tree line. I made it home quickly, without further incident. After that, when I walked by myself, I stopped cutting through the wooded area and took the longer route through the park instead. I never saw that man again, and since I'm attending a different course at a different school and no longer visit that park, I doubt I ever will. Number 6 So I'm a male nurse at a large hospital in San Francisco. I work in the ER, and as is custom, Thanksgiving night, it was very busy. Now, my wife is also a nurse for the same hospital. She works in labor and delivery. Between babies being born left and right, and the people coming into the ER, we hadn't had a chance to take a break together as we try to do every shift. So when she called, I figured it was to say that she wanted to meet up for a bit to eat in the cafeteria. When I answered, I heard in the background a male voice screaming profanities in the background and my wife, who was fluent in Spanish, trying to calm this guy down. She told me their pager wasn't working and they needed security, stat. I quickly hung up, called for security, told my fellow nurses what was going on, and ran for labor and delivery, worried sick about my wife. When I got there, I ran almost square smack dab into this visibly angry man. He wasn't huge, but bro definitely worked out and not at a gym. He was covered in prison tattoos, and he was obviously a banger. I worked out regularly, but I knew that this guy could kick my ass. He looked at me, gave me this sick grin, and started heading towards me, spouting off in Spanish. I don't speak fluent Spanish, but what I could understand scared the living shit out of me. I'm backing up as fast as I can. I start buzzing the door to the ER frantically for them to let me in. This guy's literally a foot away from me, and the door's open, and I'm pulled into safety by a doctor. Gangbanger punches the door a few times, makes a dragging sign across his throat while grinning at us both. Next thing I know, police rush into the corridor he's in. I finally make it to my wife, who, thankfully, was shaken up and unhurt. She explained to me what had happened. A young girl, only 14, came in, high fever, vomiting, distended belly. The banger claimed that he was her brother and they needed to cut her open to get a baby. 
They did an ultrasound, and to their horror, they realized that she wasn't pregnant. She had bags of drugs in her stomach. It's very common for drug mules to bring over young women from Mexico carrying drugs that way. Homeboy freaked out when they informed him his sister needed emergency surgery, and no, he wasn't getting his drugs. Thankfully, the girl survived, but the sad thing is, she'll most likely be deported once she recovers. Number 5 I'm a female corrections officer, prison guard or CO, in a state with a relatively high number of death row inmates. However, few executions are actually carried out. I used to work for a large county, but I work for a different agency now. This county was my first CO job years ago, and before that, I had worked in retail and customer service while studying criminal justice. So, I was really green. I used to be very liberal. I'm still liberal about a lot of things, but the job does change your perspective for most people. One thing that I used to believe very strongly was that no human being could be truly evil. This particular county jail is one of the oldest in the country, so parts of it have a totally linear layout. What I mean is that you have a long stretch of corridor with cells on either side, and the CEOs have to walk up and down to supervise the inmates. As you can imagine, these linear layouts are not in style anymore, because you can't see every cell at the same time, but every inmate can see you. I have to say that units like this are extremely creepy, too. I'm going to call this corridor the condos. We didn't call it that, obviously, but I don't want to share the exact term which is specific to this jail. Less than 10 years ago, a quadruple stabbing homicide happened not too far from where I grew up. The murderer, Michaels, described it as a butchering, and he killed his former girlfriend, her family, and their neighbor. When the police found Michael soaked in blood and asked him what had happened, he said, It's obvious. I just killed everyone. The cop said that he seemed completely emotionless when he said it. At that time, I'd only been a CO for about four months, and our facility received him as a pretrial detainee. Now, obviously, he wasn't our first or only murder, but the nature of the crime, stabbings, indicating a more dangerous personality than a shooting, for one thing, and his lack of remorse was horrifying. He was considered a volatile inmate, so we placed him in an observation cell in the middle of the condos where a CO could always keep an eye on him. He would stand at his glass door in silence most of the day, just watching everyone. I swear he only really spoke when he had visits. He actually had a full visits list of these big goth girls who would come in and swear that they were in love with him. I don't know if this means anything, but his ex was a big girl and he used to draw pictures of the fat female COs. For note, he was skinny and white, with brown hair. One day, I was working as a utilities officer, basically a floater who relieves people for breaks and helps out as needed. At this jail, utility officers also got away with a ton of downtime and bullshitting. I was hanging out at one of the end of the condos where you could look down and see a lot of the jail, talking to another officer on duty. As they say, there are no secrets in jail. Plus, I was aware that there were points throughout the jail where you could hear very well into neighboring cells, that sort of thing. We were being pretty quiet though. Plus, we stood a good 50 yards from Michael's observation cell. Also, you have to imagine that it would be difficult to stand in the observation cell and press your face against the glass to see the people standing at the right angle so far from you. I was telling the other CO a funny story about my weekend which I wouldn't do out on a correctional unit nowadays. But we weren't getting into anything too personal either. It was a long story involving my fiancé at the time. I wrapped up talking to this CO because I had to go to the gate to relieve another officer for chow, and I had to pass Michael's cell. I didn't like walking past it because he stood there and stared at you. And back then, I wasn't so good at hiding my nervousness. He always had his head slightly tilted down, so you could see the white under the irises of his eyes. Again, rarely saying a word. But today was different. I took one step past his door, and I heard him say Edgecomb in a barely audible whisper. I didn't even know that he knew my name. Yes, our last names are on our uniforms, but I was never his primary officer, and we'd never interacted. He caught me off guard, so instead of ignoring it, 
It stopped me in my tracks and I backpedaled to the door. He pointed to his mouth and I leaned in to listen. His eyes looked so dark. I remember I felt hypnotized. He proceeded to recite, word for word, the story I had just quietly told the other officer at the end of the condos less than two minutes before, even copying the sound of my voice down to a subtle lisp. This this seemed to go on forever. I felt like we were the only two there, no 22 millimeters of glass protecting me, just a five foot tall female and a murderer. I remember thinking for the first time of another human being, this is evil and unfixable. Finally, I said, Sir, did you need something? And he just started to laugh hysterically, and I walked away. I have been assaulted by other inmates. I've had piss thrown in my eyes. People play mind games with me constantly. I've met some damn good lip readers too, but this was like something else. Now, I work at a maximum security institution, I babysit all rapists and murderers and pedophiles. I don't know how to make this make sense to you, but this was the one and only time in my life where I felt inside of me like I was dealing with something not human. Michaels is in another institution now. He's on death row. He refuses to appeal. He made it clear to the press that this decision is not out of remorse. He has none. He just doesn't give a shit, and it is most logical in his mind him to die. Number 4 This is the most traumatic incident of my life. It still haunts me after 5 years. Although I grew up in the capital of my country, my family owns a house in one of the many islands. My grandmother grew up there and we inherited the house. This island is extremely beautiful and we went there for vacation every summer. Let me give you some info about the locals. They are very different from residents of other islands, mainly because of history. The island was not populated until pirates started dropping off their women and children that they had kidnapped there. They returned, often to rape them, and this resulted in the island being populated by people that were products of rape. On top of that, there is a specific village with a strange aura around it. They say the residents of the village are full of incest. I believe that it is true because there are a lot of retarded or odd people living there. So, you understand, the population of the island in general was developed on a messed up basis. Funnily enough, it's a highly popular tourist destination worldwide, and if you are not from there, or don't spend much time there, you probably wouldn't get it. Anyway, I was 16, and my sister was 14. We were spending our summer there, going to the beach and then going out. We were both too young to understand certain things, Plus, the crime rate in the island is pretty low, and they are generally considered safe. So, our parents were calm about us going out until late at night. I should also mention now that it was 2011, so we had cell phones, but not smartphones. We also didn't have any credit to make phone calls. That was usual for teenagers at this time, because it was expensive and we didn't have a lot of pocket money. So, we were often without credit. One night, we were hanging around the port where we lived when we met a group of local people. They were all about 20 years old and very friendly, so we were happy that they hung around with us. There were five of them, three guys and two girls that were sisters. Their names were Manos, Takis, Stavros, Tina and Elsa. The girls looked like blonde models, while the guys were the typical local youths with scooters. We were drinking when they suggested that we go to their village, the one I mentioned before, to hang out around in the girls' house. The girls had a car, so they drove us there, and the boys followed with their scooters. When we entered the house, me and my sister both realized that there was something wrong. It was dirty, and there was a bad smell coming from the backyard. I wanted to leave, but I didn't want to appear rude. Also, we didn't have a car. The house was small. The girls showed us around. When we reached the bedroom of their parents, there was bloodstains on the bed. Tina quickly changed the sheets, explaining that their dad got into a fight recently and was bleeding everywhere. She talked like it was normal. I could feel my younger sister's fear next to me. The guy sat in the living room, smoking a joint. They offered us, but we politely refused. 
Both of us felt like we needed to be sober so we could figure out a way to get away from this place. Everybody pushed us to smoke though, to the point where we couldn't say no. So, I took a puff but I didn't breathe the smoke down. But my sister didn't know this trick and she got high very fast. At that point, I was scared. I had to get us out of there. Takis came to sit next to me, talking to me in a flirty way. Stavros did the same to my sister. She was too high to resist. I watched panicked while they were kissing and he was touching her private parts. I was pushing Takis away, saying I have a boyfriend, which was a lie, but he didn't care. I was so scared. Then, the sister sat close to Manos and both started kissing him. At that point, I stood up and went to the bathroom. My mind was working like crazy but the smell of the bathroom was awful. There was a second door to the backyard. I carefully opened the door. The smell became unbearable. I felt like vomiting. There were piles of trash. I got closer. And there, near the trash, there was a dead cat. To make things worse, the body was surrounded by her kittens, also dead. I vomited on the trash, but I decided to have a closer look. And the cat did not die a natural death. She was stabbed with a knife in the belly. I quickly realized the kittens died unborn. I freaked out so much I almost fainted. My mind was telling me to run. There was indeed an exit from the backyard that would lead me to the main street. But I had to find a way to get my sister an escape. Shit. All this time my sister was there in the living room alone and high. I rushed back in, trying to look normal. When I entered the living room, everybody was close to my sister, touching her. Their hands were inside her pants, while the guys were starting to take their clothes off. She was sobering up at this point, and she was freaking out. She was saying, Please, no, I don't want to. And Manos told her to shut up and that she'll like it. I just stood there. I couldn't move. Taka stood up suddenly to bring me into their twisted game. Then something happened that I'll forever be grateful of. My sister said she needs to vomit. And it was true, she was pale and she could barely hold it back. Nobody wanted vomit on them, so they instantly let her go. She rushed to the bathroom and I went after her. She vomited and then, without saying anything, I grabbed her arm and dragged her out. She was in a really bad state, almost fainting. We rushed to the exit of the backyard and then to the main street. We had no credit on our phone, so I stopped a woman and asked to make a phone call. I called my parents to pick us up and obviously they were very alarmed. I had to explain to them what happened. They were terrified. The next few years, we were not allowed to do a lot of things until they finally calmed down. It was stupid to follow some strangers, but we were naive teenagers. When I think about the danger that we put ourselves in though, I still shiver. My parents thought about calling the police, but it was not very safe. We found out that the girl's father was dealing drugs. My country has a very high level of corruption, and police are rarely dependable, or even an option. So, we just rented out the house and never came back for vacation. Since then, my sister and I are way more suspicious and careful. I am happy we escaped and learned our lesson, but I wish we had never have met them. Number 3 When I was three, my parents moved us into a new neighbourhood. The house was nice, but kind of old. The neighbourhood was an old 50s track home area, so we'd had a pretty varied group of people living there, from all the groups that had bought the houses new young families looking for a cheap place to live, to poor people looking for cheap houses to rent. As soon as we moved in, my dad started noticing weird things about me. He would hear me giggling and laughing in my own room, and whenever he went in and asked what was so funny, I would tell him that the kids were being funny. He would also come in and wake me up and find me curled up in the closet. This happened over and over again. My parents didn't think much of it because I was a pretty imaginative kid. The thing that wigged them out the most, however, was that 
I flat out refused to walk out the front door. I would scream, yell, and cry until one of my parents carried me in and out of the house. When you walked in the front door, to the right, there was a closet, and to the left, there was a low brick wall that separated the front door from the living room. It was about four feet high and about three feet long. Just a room divider, but I never wanted to touch it or be near it. After we had lived there for a few months, my dad started making some renovations to the house. Among them was demolishing that wall. My parents dropped my brother and I off with our grandparents the day that they were going to do it so that we wouldn't be underfoot. We didn't end up going home for a week. When my dad knocked down the wall, he called the police. Inside the brick wall were bones that had turned out to be from children. To my knowledge, the cops never figured out who put them there. The house had been owned by a lot of people, many of them who had rented it out. So it just remained one of the many weird things that happened in my town that was never figured out. Number 2 When I was about 12, my great uncle John came from Ukraine to visit us in Canada. He had a lot of stories, but this one was the one that stood out. In the late 1960s, John was travelling by train from his village to another to visit family. He had to change trains at one point and was dropped off at what amounted to a platform in a hut in the middle of nowhere. There was no one else at the station other than a dirt road that led off into the surrounding woods, there was nothing there. He waited for some time, but no train came. It was winter, getting colder and darker, and just about the time he started worrying about a place to stay and some food to eat, an old woman appeared out of the twilight. She asked if he was waiting for such and such a train, and when he said he was, she said that he wouldn't be along until the following day. She asked if he needed a bed for the night, and offered him a meal and a room at her house, which she said was about an hour's walk from the station. Lodging with locals was more or less the standard when travelling in this part of the USSR, and Great Uncle John wasn't looking forward to a hungry night on a cold platform, so he was glad to accept her offer. He took his suitcase and they set off together down the dark road into the forest. It was more than an hour away, more like two, and by the time they arrived at the woman's small two-story house... John was tired and hungry. They went inside and the woman lit some oil lamps and warmed some borscht for them. It was the first time that John was able to see the woman clearly. He was a bit startled to realize that the old woman was actually a man. Not wanting to pry and too tired to care, John finished his soup and asked where he would be sleeping. She led him upstairs to a tiny room with a window that contained a single bed and nothing else. He thanked her. They said goodnight and she closed the door. Then she locked it, leaving him in the dark. Somewhat creeped out by this, John called out to her. But she didn't answer and he heard nothing else. Figuring he would deal with it in the morning and that she'd probably done it by mistake, John set his suitcase down and laid on the bed, deciding to make the best of it and get some sleep. Before he could fall asleep though, he felt the urge to pee and got out of the bed. Hoping to find a chamber pot or something he could pee in, he got onto his hands and knees and began to feel under the bed in the darkness, thinking that's where the pot would be if there was one. But instead, he found a body. Nope, Great Uncle John said, and went right to the window to see if he could exit the room that way. It was nailed shut. He knew that if he remained in the room, he was probably a dead man, but if he broke the window and tried to get out that way, was a good chance that the old woman, and who knows who else was there, would hear him and come into the room before he could get away. So he did the only thing he could do. He pulled the body from under the bed, heaved it onto the mattress and covered it with the blanket. Then he got under the bed and waited. Sure enough, about an hour later, he heard footsteps coming slowly up the stairs and then toward the room. The lock clicked and the knob turned slowly. In the gloom, John saw someone move toward the bed. Then he heard several terrific and sickening thuds. The person had bashed the body on the bed with a large crowbar, which they then dropped onto the floor right in front of John. 
There was silence. Then the person went out of the room and the door was shut again. The footsteps went down the stairs and then there was silence again. John moved out from under the bed, took the crowbar and was able to slowly pry the window open. He didn't say, but I imagine that he was shitting bricks the entire time. When the window was up, he threw his suitcase out, then dove through himself, not caring what was below him, only worried about what was behind. He landed without too much injury, then began to run into a field behind the house towards some lights in the far distance. It turned out to be a highway with some military and transport trucks on it, and John was able to get a ride to another village where he could catch a train. He didn't bother reporting what had happened to the authorities, since at the time in the USSR, there was a distinct chance that he would have been the one to get in trouble. He just thanked God that he escaped and decided that the next time he traveled to visit relatives, he would take another way. Number one. I sprang awake as the buzzing cut sharply into the dormant stillness of my subconscious. I quickly came into life as I realized the source of the buzzing continuously vibrating my pillow. Someone was ringing me, and judging by the duration of the buzzing, it seemed like whoever was on the other end was desperate for me to answer. I pulled my phone out and had to wait a few moments for my groggy eyes to focus on the name displayed on my screen. It was A. I sat up and swiped to answer the call. Hey, you woke me. What's up? Did you check them, C? A said, hurriedly. You said you'd get back to me first thing. It's 11 now, and I'm still waiting for you. Have you checked them, yes or no? Hurry the fuck up! My grogginess and general confusion to whatever the hell A was going on about did not sit well with his tone of voice. I looked over at my alarm clock. He was right. It was 11 in the morning. Way too early to be called after the events of the compound. What the fuck are you going on about, eh? Don't call me waking me up and talking gibberish after the night we've had. I need sleep, man. I replied hastily. Don't you remember? You told me earlier when I rung that you checked the photo first thing. A explained. Look, A, you're mistaken. I went straight to sleep after I got in. You wouldn't have woke me with a call even if you tried. I explained in confusion. Look, I haven't looked at the photo I took. Right now, my priority is to sleep. I heard A angrily sigh. Don't freak me out, C. You know how much the scratches freaked me out. I pressed the home button on my phone to check the call logs and didn't find any record in my logs of any call to or from A. Look, I still don't have any idea what you're on about, A. I've checked all my call logs. There's nothing there. What time did you apparently call me? And what scratches are you talking about? I heard A sigh in frustration again. Look, I don't have time for this. After we got in, I fell asleep at around 4 in the morning, but woke up after an hour after having a nightmare about the base. I was walking out of the bathroom when a toothbrush fell behind me. I turned my head around to look in the mirror when my back caught my eye. There were scratches, dude. Fucking three of them down my back. Just like those metal blinds. I didn't scratch myself. I know I didn't. I ran back to my phone to ring you, and you answered. I did speak to you. What the fuck? I gasped. Dude, that's fucked up. I have no record of you ringing me. You're freaking me out, man. I could hear A fiddling with his phone before hearing a faint. This isn't happening. A? I asked. You there? No idea what's happening, man. A said with an increasingly worrying tone in his voice. I can't see any record in my log either. I even sent you a picture of the scratches on Facebook last night. But I just checked and I didn't send it to you. I sent it to an account with random numbers in its name. It was you though. It sounded like you. It acted like you. Your mannerisms and everything. You were quite shocked when I told you about the scratches. And you kept saying you'd need to check the photos. You kept saying it over and over, and then you hung up. I assumed it was because you fell asleep or something. I'm not going to lie. He was creeping me out a bit. I could only think of one logical explanation in this moment. Hey, are you sure it wasn't part of your nightmare? 
I asked. Like you had nightmareception or something, maybe. Because I can promise you, I didn't receive any such call from you, bro. I heard silence on the other end for what felt like ten seconds. I don't even know, man. The photo I sent, it won't even load. There's no picture saved into the storage on my phone. I don't even know anymore. It all seemed so real. A explained in a defeated tone. I was beginning to drift off again and felt it best that I should catch the remaining sleep that my body is desperately calling out for. Listen, A, get some sleep. Your mind and body are tired. And with last night being quite traumatic for all of us, your body is just processing everything. You'll feel more relaxed, trust me. I suggested, while also hoping it calms him down. Yeah, you're probably right. I do feel shattered. A said. I could quite clearly tell that he hadn't slept much. I'll get some shut eye and speak to you later. When you get a chance to see the photo, send it over. Sleep tight, see. A hung up, and shortly after, I fell asleep again. A couple of hours later, I awoke feeling refreshed but also very hungry and needed breakfast as I hadn't eaten since before the urban exploration took place. I chucked on a t-shirt, grabbed my laptop, phone and camera and headed downstairs to make some breakfast. It was raining and overcast outside so there was no chance of me going out today. Not that I wanted to as I needed to rest after my exploits last night. Once I'd finished making my breakfast, I sat down at the table fired up my laptop and connected my camera via USB cable. I remembered the situation from a couple of hours ago when A had rung me about the scratches on his back. It seemed so far-fetched that I convinced myself that I had been dreaming. While waiting for Windows to boot up, I quickly reflected on last night's endeavours and how much fear and dread I felt. I had never felt anything like it before in my life. When the loud thuds happened, I would never felt so much instinct take over. It was like I had no control over my own motor functions. My brain then suddenly brought up the image in my mind of the dark shape I saw quickly leave when I spotted it when I was in the building all alone. I had never figured out what that was. Putting two and two together, I figured that it was also the source of the disembodied laugh. But was it also the culprit behind the thuds we heard above us in the last building? I shuddered to think what we would have saw if we had hung around while those thuds came nearer to us. I also wondered how questionable some of our decisions were at the time. Like carrying on when things started getting weird with the strange man in the blood and even splitting up at that point. In all though, everybody makes rash decisions when they're under the influence of fear, adrenaline or confusion. Especially when you're 18. I could now put the experience behind me though as we had done it. We had completed our biggest, scariest, and most dangerous urban exploration yet, and I had a big, well-deserved sense of achievement. Now was the time to review the photo. Windows had booted now, so I opened my computer and clicked on my camera's icon to view the images stored on it. There were three files. Odd, I thought. I only remember taking two photos. I double-clicked on the file with the earliest file date, only to be greeted with a file corrupt error message. <sighs> Good start. I double clicked on the image, second most recent data stamp. And, as I expected, I was presented with a blurred vortex because of moving the camera away too early after taking the photo. My sense of achievement was about to evaporate big time. Just as I was about to double click on the latest photo, which would be the good one of A, I received a notification of a Facebook message from A. I opened the message app to see A had started sending me a series of messages. They read, See, they're real. They're fucking real. The scratches, see. The fucking scratches are real. These messages were followed by a picture of A's back with three deep scratches down the middle. They must have been about 30 centimeters long and looked the same as the scratches on the metal blinds from last night. The swelling that should have resulted because of any scratch to the body wasn't present and they were scabbed over which suggested to me that the scratches occurred a few hours ago, which conveniently matches up with A's situation earlier. Without replying to A, a light bulb had lit up in my head, a very anxious light bulb, the sort of light bulb you hoped would be a false alarm. 
I had a hunch which I followed through with by finally double clicking on the final photo. My heart sunk so hard and fast, I nearly fell off my chair as the image loaded. What I saw brought back that familiar feeling of dread that I'd hoped I'd left back at the compound. In the photo, I could see A performing his pose as I remembered it last night, and I could see A's shadow behind him. When taking the photo, I was directly in front of A, but a little over to the left, which cast his shadow a bit off to the right behind him. However, there was another shadow on the left of A, like someone dressed in all black was stood to the left behind him from my perspective. I pictured in my head the scene from when I took the photo to attempt to debunk it. It couldn't have been B as he was stood over by the stairs, which were completely out of the shot of the photo. I looked closer at this shadow and could see what I believe was its right hand holding something long and thin, almost sharp looking. I looked back at A in the photo and saw that he was holding his torch, but in his left hand. The more I looked at this photo, the more disorientated and sick my stomach became. It just didn't make sense. I was behind the flashlight source. There was no other light source on at the time in the room. I still couldn't make sense of it, but I was also very alarmed by this finding and very concerned for A. I became conscious that the skies outside seemed to have darkened the rain was lashing down upon my conservatory. I hadn't heard it this loud for a while. I thought it was about time to reply to A. I wrote, Get your ass over to mine now. Bring B. Need to show you both something. A replied, You've seen the weather outside. But I don't like the sound of all of this. I'll get B. See you in 30. I shut my laptop as I didn't want to look at the photo again until they arrived. I turned on the lights and some music at maximum volume to drain out the rain and my own thoughts. Just after the half hour mark, my doorbell rang and I quickly welcomed A and B into my house. B was uninformed of the events which had transpired in the last few hours and was understandably frustrated with having to leave the comfort of his house to go into the rain. We need to go over some stuff from last night, I explained to both. A, fill B in on your nightmare and supposed phone call with me this morning, as B will need to know the situation before I show you both what I need to show you. Scratches. Situations. B questioned, looking at A and I with a suspicious look. Guys, what's going on? A explained to B about the scratches, and the mysterious phone call he had with me after he had a nightmare. B looked on in disbelief. Show me, B demanded. Show me the scratches, A. Eh? A obliged, removing his t-shirt and exposing his back. The scratches looked even worse in person. They looked a lot deeper than they did in the photo. B and I couldn't help but run our fingers over the scratches. There was a slight groove, but I also noticed something else. Hey, the area around the scratches is really hot, like burning. Perhaps just... B cut me off. Just like the scratches on the metal blinds, B gasped. This, this is really concerning. It doesn't end there, I said abruptly. There's something in the photo I took of A you need to see. I motioned for A and B to sit down at my table before grabbing my laptop and opening the lid to the photo and turning it in their direction. I didn't say anything to them as I wanted them to spot the shadow for themselves. I could tell when they had spotted it. As their expressions turned to shock and fear. A turned white. That, that doesn't make any sense. You must have shot your finger in the way, C. I shot B a bewildered look. Really, B? That's your only logical explanation, I remarked. Since when does my finger look like a person? There was no comeback to my rhetoric as the room was silent while A and B continued to analyze the picture. Suddenly, a got up and quickly got his coat on. A looked terrified, but he had an angry expression which confused me a little. Why would he be angry? Before I could say anything, A glared at me in the same intimidating way he did at the compound and fired a warning shot. A's whole demeanor changed in an instant, which caught me off guard. If I were you, buddy, I'd delete that and not mention it ever again. Understood? 
and I looked at each other, completely stunned as he ran out the door and slammed the door behind him. What was that all about? B questioned. What's gotten into him? That was totally not the reaction I was expecting. I mean, I'm looking at this photo terrified, not angry. I paused to reply for a moment as I pieced some strands of thought together. I felt like I knew something, but I couldn't work out what I knew. A says a lot of things. I began while staring at the empty corridor to my front door. But that wasn't him speaking. 